All right, good evening to everyone. Good evening, good evening. We have the numbers steady climbing as people are joining us for this webinar this evening. Thank you so much for being here. Give about another 30 seconds because those numbers are climbing. And make sure you get as many people in here as possible before we get started. So thank you so much for being with us this evening. All right. Well, let's go ahead and get started this evening. I want to thank everyone for joining us tonight. It's five o'clock on a Thursday evening. Cold outside is dry. That's wrapped for that. But it's still a little bit cold, but I appreciate you joining us. And um, my name is Mr. Joshua Kirk. I am the Director of College Readiness and Access for the Chafee Joint Union High School District. Uh, also joining us this evening is our Assistant Superintendent of Instruction, Dr. Jessica Ketchajai. Good evening, Dr. Ketchajai. Thank you for being here. And I wanted to just start off with just those brief introductions. And let me give you some background of what we're expecting tonight, okay? First off, this is a Zoom, but it's webinar format. So it's a little bit different than your traditional a Zoom meeting. So if you're looking for hundreds of faces on the screen, I apologize. You're not going to see that. Just this beautiful face and the other beautiful face that's on the screen with me. Um, because we have such large numbers of families that are joining us this evening, um, we wanted to make sure that there was no other distractions or interruptions. However, you still do have the opportunity to ask a question within the chat feature. So throughout this evening, Dr. Ketchenchai will be collecting your questions that you ask and putting those together, organizing those. And we will be working to answer each of those questions and get back to you and sending those responses uh, via email and even posting those responses on the website. But just given the magnitude of the number of people that are joining this evening, uh, we wanted to make sure that we were efficient with our time. And I'm gonna do my best to go as detailed and as thorough in this process to hopefully answer your questions just through the presentation. And if not, I will be sure to make sure that we follow up and respond to those questions that you put in the chat for us to be able to review and get back to you. Okay, so thank you so much for your time and for joining us this evening. The purpose for tonight. Okay, so tonight is all about getting a chance to hear from me um, and from our district as a representative of our district office um, about some of the changes in the revised guidelines and procedures that we have put in place that will be starting in the summer of 2024 in regards to dual enrollment and off-campus high school courses. Okay, so get a chance for me to be able to give some information on what those are um, and then purpose behind those changes. And also some of the intentional efforts we're putting in place to ensure that we're trying to provide sustainable supports and access for our kids to really take advantage of these wonderful opportunities that are being provided. Okay, so you get a chance to hear that. I will also talk through what's the process for a student that is interested in taking a dual enrollment or off-campus high school course, and they would like for that to not only be on their college transcript, but also be on their high school transcript. What is that process? Okay, so we'll get a chance to go through that. Um, and then I will also show you where you can go and get this additional information. Plus, I want you to know I will be sending up a follow-up message out to families, either tomorrow or Monday the latest. My goal is tomorrow, okay? And it will give a recap of this evening's uh, presentation the main points that we discussed, it will also have a link to this video, okay? So just in case if you missed anything, you wanted to go back and see it again, you're more than welcome to do so. Uh, and we'll also have this posted on our website as well, okay? So please don't feel like you're gonna miss something tonight. Ask your questions, we will keep track of that and we will get back to you on that. And we'll make sure that we follow up with the solid information so that you can refer back to it as we move forward, okay? But thank you again for joining us this evening. So. Let's start first with talking about why did we go through this process and why did we look at revising and providing some new guidelines and procedures um, for our students in regards to dual enrollment and off-campus high school courses. So as we went through this process, one of the things that we focused on was making sure that we can put in place some guidelines that will provide support for sustainable uh, functionality, as well as sustainable support for our student programs that are currently on our campus, okay? You see over there the number over 3,400. So that number is just this past summer alone, the summer of 2023, that is how many off-campus and dual enrollment courses our students district-wide took, okay? You look at that number, that is amazing that we have kids that are reaching out and taking the advantage of these opportunities, especially through 
through dual enrollment. However, we wanna ensure that that access to that opportunity also can be sustained and is not have some uh, unintentional impacts of other student programs that we offer on our campuses. So we went through this process looking to see how can we continue to make sure that we're providing access with guidelines and structure and still a sustainable support for our students' programs and experiences that we can provide for our kids district-wide. The other piece is we wanted to see how can we begin to be intentional about increasing equitable access to dual enrollment and the benefits that dual enrollment provides for our kids through across, across our district. We know that there's a large number of kids that are taking advantage of this, but the reality is, and it's not just in our district and our community, but nationwide, uh, a large proportion of the students that are taking those courses, a lot of them are students that may have the ability to have specific resources or supports or transportation or access to additional time and, and the ability to be able to really take advantage of those, those uh, options and resources through dual enrollment. But there's also a number of our students that would truly benefit from this opportunity, but because of just life situations and circumstances may not have the ability to take full advantage of that. So we're working to see how can we meet our students where they are? How can we bring that opportunity to them and increase that equitable access by trying to bring dual enrollment courses to our high school campuses in a partnership with Chaffey College? And so we'll talk about that, but I want you to know our focus behind this was twofold. It was that how do you provide sustainable support for our student programs? How do we continue to make sure that we're providing access with guidelines and making sure that we begin to intentionally look to increase equitable access? Okay, so keep that in mind as we go through everything this evening. So how we got here? When I tell you there was plenty of discussions, that's a, that's an understatement, okay? There's been a, a lot of conversations that have taken place and actually conversations specifically to this and looking at revising our guidelines and procedures, yeah, you could probably go as far back as a year ago when those conversations started on a smaller scale. And that can progressively increase to us having discussions and conversations district-wide with our educational partners. Um, a lot of research, a lot of conversations with other districts, looking at other policies, other practices, best practices, what's most effective, um, looking locally, regionally, and across the state. And so there was a lot of common best practices, excuse me, that were already in place or being implemented that kind of gave us an idea of, okay, what that may or may not look like. And then listening to our own educational partners, adding some additional adjustments to it. But this truly was a collaborative effort in revising these district guidelines and procedures with the focus on, as I mentioned earlier, how we provide sustainable support for our student programs and looking to increase access for dual enrollment across our campuses district-wide, okay? As we talk through this, please keep in mind that all of these new guidelines and procedures, they go into effect for the summer of 2024, which is this upcoming summer, okay? So although uh, we are still in the spring of 2024, we know that coming up here pretty soon are gonna be the windows that open up for registration for summer courses. And so we wanted to make sure we provided this information in advance so that you understood what that process was gonna be because these guidelines will need to be filed since those courses are gonna be taken in this summer and beyond, okay? So let's start first with talking about dual enrollment and off-campus courses, what those are, what does that mean for us? What is this discussion or what is it that we put in our revised guidelines and procedures that explain um, these new processes? Okay, so starting first with what are dual enrollment courses? First, dual enrollment courses are college courses, right, that students are able to take that by being enrolled in both the college institution and our high school, being duly enrolled, can earn credit for both institutions simultaneously, okay? So by taking a course, a student will be able to earn credit for college, as well as earning credit for high school, all right? For us as a district, we look at that with two different types of dual enrollment uh, course offerings that we look to support. One is through the College and Careers Access Pathways uh, grant, okay, or the CCAP. You get used to that, you're gonna hear that a lot, okay? So the CCAP. The CCAP is an actual grant that the, the state of California provided, which allowed for all community colleges across the state to be able to create formal partnerships with the K-12 and high school districts within the boundaries of those specific community colleges for the purpose of increasing equitable access to dual enrollment courses by looking to bring those dual enrollment courses on the campuses of high schools during the regular school day for students. So we talk about equitable access. We know that there's some things that go on in life and it may be a challenge for students to get on 
uh, on another college campus, or even to have the time online outside of the school day, this is an effort to ensure that we can really capitalize students when we have them on our campus and allow them to tap into that dual enrollment opportunity. We are working on, not working on, we actually have implemented a pilot of our first CCAP dual enrollment course this year. And this semester, as we speak, we have at least one section or one class on all of our eight comprehensive sites where we have at least one senior English class that is piloting a dual enrollment English course, which allows them to earn their senior English credit for the semester, as well as college credit for English 1A. Now, English 1A is a college entry level uh, English course. It's the entry level course that every student coming into college will need to take regardless of their major. And it will be able to be transferable to any Cal State or any UC. So for a student to be able to have that opportunity before they graduate, having a chance to have success and experience of what it's like to take a secondary level college course, especially with the supports that Chafee College and our district have worked together to provide, we're excited about what this could really do for our kids. Next, we have non-college and career access pathways or non-CCAP uh, dual enrollment courses. Those are the dual enrollment courses that the vast majority of our kids have been taking over the last couple of years, all right? And that's through two forms, two programs either the HSP or the high school partnership dual enrollment classes or non-HSP um, dual enrollment courses. HSP dual enrollment classes, those are dual enrollment college courses that Chafee College provides for all of the students that are in specific partnership with Chafee College. And there's a number of those districts. So a number of the districts that are in that partnership with Chafee College have the opportunity to take a list of courses that Chafee College provides free of charge Okay, no tuition and plenty of supports and resources. And those courses are filled with high school students from those districts. Non-HSP, our high school students can still take as well free of charge for tuition, a minor fee, but tuition is still for free. But it also provides an opportunity for community members or non-students from our district to be able to take those classes as well. Okay, but nonetheless, it is still a dual enrollment class, either HSP or non-HSP, that a student can earn college credit and high school credit. Something that's important I want to mention, and this is an emphasis, especially as we move forward, um, looking into next year. My goodness, we're looking at next year already. Students that are looking to take a dual enrollment class, they must have five district classes in order to be eligible to take that. Okay. So, and that's part of our board policy that's been there for a while. What that means is they need to have five classes that they're taking on their high school campus. And in addition to that, they can take a dual enrollment course. So even if they're taking one on campus through CCAP, that CCAP class they're taking on the campus during the school day counts as a college class. So they'll need five additional uh, regular classes that they're taking, okay? Just something to note because we're gonna make sure that we're continuing to, to inform our families and students about that practice. Now, what are off-campus high school courses? Off-campus high school courses are not college courses, okay? And they're provided from by other accredited um, high school level institutions, um, typically charter schools, uh, maybe like methods or options for youth or UC Scouts. These are examples of institutions that offer high school level courses, but are outside of our district. Okay. And so those are what we would define as off campus high school courses. Okay. So let's talk a little bit about these new guidelines and procedures. And now we're going to start talking about some of those changes that have taken place. First, let's talk about the credit equivalency and how that's been changed. So in our current language and in years past, what we have had is language that explains what does a college unit equal as far as to high school credits. The past formula we had was one college unit equaled 2.5 high school credits, which, mean if, which means if a student took a traditional college course that was typically three units, in the past, a student would complete that course, they would get their three college units, and then they would earn 7.5 high school credits because it's 2.5 credits for every unit. And the conversations that we've had and worked through, even if a student completed a college course that equaled a full year course for us, they wouldn't earn the 10 credits, they would only earn 7.5, which was kind of funky, right? And it, it made it look a little wonky on the transcript and in common sense, just didn't make sense. Right, didn't make sense. So we had some conversations and made some adjustments there. So now, starting in the summer and beyond, any approved dual enrollment course a student takes that is two units or less, 
two college units or less will equal five high school credits. If they take a college course that is three college units or more, it will be 10 high school credits, okay? So that will be in place starting this summer. However, there is a list that we use. It's called, called a course equivalency list. And on this list, it identifies the Chaffee College courses and what that course equates to as far as the high school courses we offer in our district. It will also show how many units each of those college courses are and how many high school credits the student would earn by completing that course. On that list, it will also show that there are a couple of courses that although they may be a three unit college course, it only equals a semester of one of our courses. Okay, and we have an example there. The reason for that is when we look at a course equivalency, we look at the course description and outlines of the college course, and then we look to see how that, uh, how that line lines up with the high school courses that we offer and is the curriculum, is the content being covered in that college course enough to cover the full year's worth of content that's being covered in that, in that high school course. If that's not the case, and it's only covering really what's focused in the semester, then it becomes a semester equal, right? An example we have here is History 17. It is a three-unit college course that Chaffee College offers, but what's covered in that course only equals to what's covered in the first semester of U.S. History. When we have examples like that, and there's a couple that's on the list that will be updated and put on the website for families, those courses will only be five high school credits, okay? So a student will need to also take History 18, which will equal the second semester of U.S. history. And that was how they will earn their full 10 credits or full years worth of U.S. history. There's a couple other courses that show that as well. And that'll be highlighted on that document. As far as CCAP dual enrollment courses, such as the English one I talked to you about earlier that we're piloting, those classes will be five high school credits per semester to allow for a student to complete a full year's worth on their campuses. Okay. Now, as far as off-campus high school courses, those are high school courses, okay? So they're gonna be equal to what we offer. So if they're approved to take a high school course, it's typically a semester course, you earn five credits, it's gonna to transition to five credits on your high school transcript. Okay, so that's pretty simple. Okay, now, let me go back before I explain this part. Remember when I talked about the focus of what we went into this process uh, looking to consider as far as support for sustainability for student programs, as well as looking to increase equitable access. Well, now we're talking about some of the other steps that were put in place that were guidelines to allow for that sustainable support while ensuring that we're not eliminating access for dual enrollment, okay? So I want you to keep that in mind as we're talking through this because that was the focus point for us. So what I'm explaining now is another part of the new guidelines and structures for a student looking to take a dual enrollment or off-campus high school course and what that means for their Chafee district transcript. So 40 high school equivalent credits from an accredited institution outside of our district can be added to a student's Chafee district transcript. Okay, so let me explain. 40 high school equivalent credits. What that means is, let's just say in a traditional sense, if a student were to take, um, were to take a dual enrollment class, that's three units three college units, that equals 10 high school credits. They could do that four times if they were to do it in that form. And that would be 40 high school equivalent credits that they can take from uh, outside institution and will go on their college transcript. To be clear, that does not mean that they can only take four dual enrollment classes. It does not mean that they can only take 40 high school equivalent credit worth of outside courses. It just means that's the number that the amount that can go in their high school transcript. They can take far more than that. And actually, we encourage it, especially if the student is interested and has found their passion and they're looking at a career pathway or they're moving towards a certification or their AA or something of that nature. Students can still take additional courses and those courses will always be on their college transcript. And the courses on their college transcript will still also need to be put on their college applications when they apply at that time. So the universities will be able to see all the courses they've taken in their high school career, either through dual enrollment that's on their high school transcript, and any additional courses that they've also taken that is not on their high school transcript, but it is on their college transcript, okay? So taking advantage of that, that opportunity to take these courses free of tuition, 
and really be able to explore those career interests and get a head start saving money, there's nothing wrong with that at all. Okay, and we definitely encourage that. However, within the guidelines and structure to support those efforts, it is a 40 max that will be able to go on their high school transfer. Within that 40, it will be broken up by a max of 10 high school credits per department or subject. So let me explain that part. Let's say, for instance, and I'm just thinking off the top of my mind, let's say a student takes, um, they've already completed their life science and their physical science requirements for high school, correct? And let's say they want to take another college course and they're looking at do it. So let's just say they take chemistry or physics, okay? They take a physics class, they earn their three credits or four credits, depending on what the course is, their three or four units, I'm sorry, for college, which means they will earn their 10 high school credits for that science course. And that will be 10 of the 40 credits they can put on their, their high school transcript. But that means that they have now taken or put on 10 high school equivalent credits from the science department. So if they were looking to take another dual enrollment class to put on a transcript, it would not be able to be a science class that would go on, an additional science class that could go on the transcript. It would have to be from another subject or department, okay? And this is for a couple of reasons. The main reason though, it allows for students to be able to spread out what their experiences are, as well as being able to maximize those experiences and putting them on their high school transcript and not just focusing simultaneously on one area, okay? So allow to spread out that experience. As far as CCAP dual enrollment courses, remember the CCAP dual enrollment courses are the courses that we're looking at offering on our campuses during the school day. Those courses will not count towards the 40 credit limit or those guidelines, okay? So those dual enrollment credits they earn, that will not count as an outside institution uh, 40 credit guideline because they're taking that course on our campus and our teachers will be part of that learning experience for the students and it's during their school day. So that's another reason why we're looking to really see and really excited about the possibility of looking to expand those opportunities through CCAPs on our campuses district-wide. So we're working on that process, but there's a lot of benefits that can be provided through that. Any of the courses taken prior to the summer of 24 will not count towards the 40 credit limit. So no matter if a student has zero credits coming from an outside institution, or if they already have 40, 30, 50, 20, credits from dual enrollment or any other institutions that's already on their high school transcript or they've already taken it or they're currently taking it this semester, those credits will not count towards the 40. So every student, their window of 40 credits from an outside institution starts in the summertime, regardless of what has happened in the past, okay? So please know that that is the case and we're not going back and, and uh, taking any other opportunities away from students there. This is a key important uh, piece here. Requests to take these courses, especially off-campus high school courses, um, those must be approved in advance before the start of that class in order for it to be eligible to be on your high school transcript. Okay. The process that's already in place right now for students that are taking dual enrollment classes, it already allows for the school to be able to approve a student before they can move forward in the enrollment process. So that's pretty much built in. Well, for those off-campus high school courses, it is imperative that they go through the approval process and get approval before they start that class. To be clear, if there's a situation where a student shows up and they come to a counselor or come to the school site um, after this summer, you know, or even they show up and they say, hey, I've completed this class online. There were no conversations that took place with us. They did not go through our approval process then that would, of course would not qualify to be able to go on the high school transcript, okay? And so this is why we're front loading. This is why we're trying to educate and inform our families now so that they're aware of that process. And as these windows open up to, to register for these courses, you have time to be able to ensure you know how to take the proper steps to do so appropriately, okay? Okay, so graduation requirement courses. And before I say, let me, show this. So when we talk about graduation requirement courses, we're not talking about A to G. A to G requirements are higher than just the graduation requirement courses, but within our expectations of our district, these are the graduation requirement courses. So when we say that term graduation requirement courses, this is what we're referring to. The computer requirement, there's a, a, a competency or an expectation that they complete um, a semester course, at least a semester course or a comp computer competency exam. 
Um, English credits, 40 English credits a student must complete to graduate from our district. That's an English class all four years. 20 math credits, that means them going and completing integrated, at least integrated one and integrated two. That's the bare minimum to graduate. Two years of PE, okay? Science, 20 credits, but that's 10 credits of life science and 10 credits of physical science. That's the graduation requirement. For social science, that's 10 credits for world history, 10 credits for US history, and five credits, e credits each for government and econ. And that's how you get your 30 credits there. World languages, visual and performing arts, and our career technical education or CTE courses. That's a blend of 30 total credits that a student needs to complete within that parameter of those departments, of those subjects, okay? And it can be done in a multitude of ways, but there's a total of 30 credits that needs to be completed within those three departments. And then the beyond that, there's 70 additional credits that a student must complete, and that can be completed in a multitude of ways after they meet these requirements. That totals 230 graduation requirements, okay? So going back, when we're talking about graduation requirement courses, we're talking about meeting those credits, all right, first before you can do something else. So graduation requirement courses must be taken on district campuses, okay? However, there are possibilities of exceptions being considered for a student to maybe take a graduation requirement course through dual enrollment or an off-campus high school course if it meets the following criteria. Because we know there's situations, especially when a student gets to sophomore year, that schedule really gets tight. And sometimes it's extremely difficult for them to remain in certain programs without some type of flexibility or opportunities to provide the students. Okay, and we definitely don't want to create an unnecessary barrier. So one of those reasons is if it is for a remediation purpose or credit recovery, okay, the student needs to retake a class, okay, and they've already taken it one time in our district, that could be an exception where the principal or administrator designee, and when we say administrator designee, it's we're really talking about our assistant principals of instruction, um, or it can be another AP as well, but those are the first ones that you would go to. They would be the ones that would look to consider the approval for an exception. Okay, so for credit recovery purposes, or if it's the student needs to be able to take a graduation requirement course through dual enrollment um, to allow for flexibility in their high school schedule that would allow them to remain in a career pathway that they're committed to or in any enrichment program that we offer on our campuses. So if it's a, maybe they're working towards a specific career path certification, right? And they need some flexibility in their schedule to stay on that path. That can be a reason why it can be considered, right? For an exception. Um, we give fire tech there. It's another career pathway as a potential um, consideration there. Some of our enrichment programs, if students in AVID, if they're in band or in color guard, or if they're uh, in any of our student leadership groups, we have link crew, we have peer counseling, we have ASP, we have student achievement, we have a multitude of different programs that students are participating in on our campuses. We have their theater and choir and dance. And there's, there's a number of programs that students, um, if they need that flexibility to be able to remain in those programs on their schedule, then those are considered, um, those are the only considerations that can be thought about for exceptions, okay? What won't be considered is if a student says, I just want a lighter schedule next year, or I don't really like this teacher, or I don't really wanna take this next year. I apologize, you're more than welcome to still take those courses for dual enrollment, right? And they'll still be on your college transcript. But for those reasons, it wouldn't qualify for uh, a reasonable exception to allow for it to count on your high school transcript as well. Okay, so you'll need to uh, only take that for college purposes. And the next part is seniors. And we've actually put this in play this year to ensure that we don't put any student in any uh, tough spot or any family in tough spot. But seniors cannot take a non CCAP dual enrollment course for a graduation requirement during the second semester of their senior year. And here's why. The time frame for grades to actually be submitted and distributed to students for the college is days after the actual graduation date for our district. So we really legally would not be able to validate and confirm that a student has met all of the, the requirements to say, yes, you have officially graduated from high school because we would be waiting on that grade. Okay. 
The difference between non-CCAP and CCAP is if it's a CCAP course that's on our campus, our high school teacher is in there. We have access to be able to know what that grade is and have that submitted on time. That wouldn't be an issue. But we don't want to put a student or family in a situation where them walking or officially earning their, their uh, diploma is in jeopardy or limbo because we're waiting on that grade. And it's no no issue with uh, JP College that it's just the time frames don't like. So we don't want to put families in that spot. Yeah. We're through the graduation requirements already. And so let's talk a little bit about dual enrollment grades. Okay, dual enrollment grades. So beginning in the summer of 2024, some dual enrollment grades can actually be weighted. All right. When we say weighted, it means that they would have their grade would have an additional point to equivalent to an honors course or an AP course, which would, you know, give some, some boost to the GPA. Okay. How? For a non-CCAP dual enrollment course, in order for it to be considered a weighted grade, it must meet all four of this, these criteria below, okay? It has to be a course that can be transferred to a UC or a Cal State. It has to be a college course that meets ADG requirements. It has to be a college course that is three college units or more. And it has to be a college course that is not available on that student's high school campus, okay? If it meets all four of those, then that would be a dual enrollment non-CCAP course that the grade could be weighted, okay? Now, in regards to CCAP dual enrollment courses, beginning this summer and beyond, those courses, those grades will be weighted, okay? And that will be a change. Now, with the pilot that we're currently doing, those grades will not be weighted. And it's for a couple of reasons. One, we did not communicate that it would be. Two, our current language does not support that course being weighted. And so we could not change that until these new guidelines procedures were put in place. Okay, so that's why moving forward, it would be, and it's a pilot too. And typically with a pilot you have, it's a pilot. So you go through those adjustments and make adjustment changes as needed, okay? So let's speak a little bit about the process to request approval. So we're at the point where, all right, a student is interested and wants to take an off-campus high school course, okay? And there's an approval process for this. And so we're going to go through what that is. So this is this process is for any student who is looking to have an outside course added to their high school transcript. So if it's a dual enrollment course or it's an off-campus high school course, if they're looking for this course to be approved to go on their high school transcript within that 40 credit guideline, this is the process they would go through. If they're just looking to take an additional course through dual enrollment or an additional off-campus course, and it is not going on their high school transcript, it is staying on their college transcript, specifically dual enrollment, they would just follow the regular enrollment process for that institution, okay? But what this does, it allows for the process to go through for us to be able to review and give official approval for that course to go on the high school transcript, okay? So if that is the case, the first step would be the student needs to communicate with their school counselor. The counselor needs to be aware of what that request is, the course that they're looking to take, the reason behind it. Okay, so they need to communicate with their school counselor. There will be a form, a request for approval form that the student will be able to have. They'll get that with their parents. They review it. Parents and students will sign. Okay, and then they turn that back in to their counselor or to the assistant principal instruction office. The principal or administrator designee, which would typically be our assistant principal of instruction, once they get that form, they will review and look into it and see if this meets the qualifications for the student to be able to be approved to take this course. Please make sure that you allow for at least five business days when that form is turned in. I know how eager you may be, but if you turn it in on a Monday and come back on a Tuesday or a Wednesday or a Thursday, there's a good chance it may still not be ready. So at least allow for a reasonable five business days at least to allow for the staff chance to be able to look through it and be uh, sure in the decision that they're making for that student, okay? But once it is approved and the student is informed about that, student can go ahead and finish the registration process and take that course, okay? Now, this part is important and I'll explain why. If you are approved to take this course, you're taking this course and for whatever reason, the student drops or the student doesn't complete the course it is very important that they communicate with their school counselor or administration to let them know that they did not complete that class, okay? That allows us as a school site and as a district to be proactive in ensuring that when we're scheduling students' schedules for the following semester, that we're placing them in the most appropriate courses 
as possible. Okay, and so please make sure you communicate that. Now, if the student does go through and they complete that process, they complete the class, it's done. It is the student and family's responsibility to make sure they bring in a copy of the official grader transcript of that course they completed to the school registrar. Okay, bring it to the high school registrar. Once they receive it, they'll be able to confirm, look at the list to see if the student did actually receive prior approval. And once they see that, okay, then they'll go ahead and put it on a high school transcript. Okay, and that will be part of within their 40 credit allotment. Okay. Now for the incoming freshman class, class of 2028. Man, my goodness, class of 2028. So for the incoming freshman class, if you are looking at a dual enrollment course to take this summer, first thing to keep in mind is that you must graduate from eighth grade first to be declared an actual freshman, okay? Um, if you're looking to do so prior to, you're still technically not a freshman year. You're still under the umbrella of being in middle school or junior high. So completing eighth grade first and the window for enrollment in these courses will still be open at that time. But then these are the courses that we would look to approve, right? And focus on only these courses that we would look to approve for incoming freshmen during the summer, okay? Uh, guidance two, guidance three, and cinema 26. Now these are courses that they can earn elective credit for, all right? If they decide to have this also on their high school transcript, it would be elective credit, but nonetheless, if they take these courses, these will be college units that they would have on their college transcripts, okay? Um, but I, as I mentioned before, if it is placed on their high school transcript, it would be for elective credit, okay, elective credit, all right? Um, but those are the courses that we would be focusing on approving for freshmen. We haven't had a chance or opportunity yet to, to truly meet your, your students. We're not saying that we don't believe in their ability but we haven't had a chance to get them on our campuses, really get them involved in our programs to know where their levels are. Um, and so this is a, 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 we feel confident in knowing that this will still be a great opportunity for students to have that experience early on with a college course, with college staff, to be able to build that confidence in knowing that, man, before we even started high school, I already had a chance to know what it's like to have secondary education experience and have success. So we definitely want to look at them encouraging it, okay? So a quick recap. That was a lot of information, but don't forget, I mentioned that I will be sending a follow-up message. My goal is to get it to you tomorrow, if not tomorrow. Give me some grace, and it'll be out early next week, okay? A recap of the main things that we talked about. It will also include in there a link to the official new guidelines and language, um, and it'll have all this information here. Also have links for the actual approval forms. So if you want to click those out, click and print those out to have those, you can look at starting that process if you needed those forms. Uh, but that information will all be in the follow-up, okay? And it will also be on uh, the website that I'm going to show you in a second, how to access it, our district dual enrollment website, excuse me, that we are actually in the process of finishing updating so that it's current and up-to-date, okay? But a quick recap, we talked about the new guidelines and procedures that are beginning all in the summer of 2024, okay? We explained what a CCAP dual enrollment class is, a non-CCAP dual enrollment class is, and what off-campus high school courses are. Okay, we talked about the changes in the new high school credit equivalency. It went from one point one unit equaling 2.5 credits to now two or less college units equals five high school credits, three college units or more equals 10 high school credits. We talked about the guidelines for the 40 outside credits for going on to a high school transcript for our district, um, and that students can, and we encourage them to take, you could take more than those 40 high school credit equ equivalencies. You could take more and we'll definitely approve those, okay? Uh, we talked about that 40 being 10 per department, all right? We talked about graduation requirement courses must be completed on our district campuses. However, if they meet that criteria, they can be considered for exceptions. Uh, we talked about the dual, enroll dual enrollment weighted grades, all right? Starting this summer and beyond, CCAP dual enrollment courses on our campuses, those grades will be weighted and non-CCAP dual enrollment courses must meet those four criteria pieces in order to be considered weighted. And those four are must be a course that can transfer to a Cal State or UC, must be a course that is three college units or more, it must be a college course that meets the ADG requirements, and it must be a course that is not available on the student's high school campus, okay? And then lastly, we also emphasize the importance of making sure that the request to take these uh, courses that the approval must take place before the start of that class. And if you start that class before the approval, unfortunately, we will not be able to put that on your high school transcript, okay? 
So really quickly, uh, I talked a little bit about our uh, dual enrollment uh, webpage that we have on our district website. If you go to our district website, www.cjuhsd.net, you go over to the resources tab right here, and then this will pop up and go down where it says Chafee College Dual Enrollment. All right, you click on that, it will take you to our dual enrollment page. It is not done being updated, okay, but it is being worked on. We hope to get that done tomorrow, all right? Uh, give a little grace to early next week, let worst case, but working on getting that done tomorrow, okay? So that's where you'll be able to access this additional information in addition to what I'm going to be sending out to families after this, um, after this webinar, okay? Also, if you have additional questions or interested in knowing more information regarding the dual enrollment program that Chafee College provides, this is a great website to go to. It's a one-stop shop, okay? If you go to www.linktr.ee slash dual underscore enrollment, click on that link, and then it'll take you to this website. You can scroll all the way down. There's much more information below, but it walks you through and explains what HSP and non-HSP courses are, examples of those courses. It gives you tutorials on how to actually go through the, the application process, how to get your Chafee College ID number, um, the enrollment process, the registration process. It also gives you links to resources and supports that Chafee College provides. If you have questions and would like to reach out and talk to one of their Chafee College counselors or academic advisors or support staff, they have links for you to be able to do that as well. Just a plethora of information. This is where I actually direct a lot of our families to go when they have questions because a lot of your information could be found here. And uh, Chafee College has done a great job of providing that, that information for our families to know about the wonderful benefits that are provided with the dual enrollment program and the partnership we have with them there. Okay, so please, please take advantage of that. And then lastly, I want to thank you. I know it is, uh, it is man, it's 5.40. 5.40 on a Thursday evening. I appreciate you being with us, okay? My web, my email is right here, all right? If you have any questions that you specifically would like to ask me, feel free to reach out with my email. I will still be following up with all those questions that have been put in the chat. And I know Dr. Ketchenchai has been working uh, to organize those, and we're, we're going to get that information out to you. So thank you again, Dr. Ketchichai. I appreciate it. But if you have any other questions, please, please email me, reach out to me, and we will be responding to the questions you put in there. But I want to thank you so much uh, for joining us tonight. I want to thank all of our, our school counselors, all of our school administration, especially our district counselor liaisons. They've done a phenomenal job of being a big part of this and helping us get through this process. So thank you. And we're in it to try to provide support and sustainable support for our kids as we move forward. So have a great evening and we hope to see you soon. Thank you.